As gamers, I think we all have that one game that we were really hyped for when we saw the initial trailers for it, but for some reason, couldn't really get into it when we experienced the game for the first time. It could be that it wasn't what we were expecting, maybe we weren't just in the mood for it at the time. Regardless, these things unfortunately happen. And for me, Nunu Kuni Raft of the White Witch was that game. From the charming visuals, how it seemed to have that childlike sense of adventure within its framework, I was really excited for Nunu Kuni to the point that I bought the collector's edition day one. But unfortunately, I didn't got into it at the time with me stopping right around Castaway Cove. So why am I making a video about Nunu Kuni years later now? Well, from constant reinsurance from my friends saying that the game gets better after you get it on the boat, and how Nunu Kuni 2 is right around the corner, I decided to say, screw it, and tried it for the second time. So having beaten the game, has my opinion softened for this game? <laughs> I would say I appreciate it more now that I actually played it through to completion, and I can definitely understand why people love this game, but I do think this game has some pretty noticeable flaws that really does hold it back, even though it has some really strong points as well that really does make it stand out, even compared to the RPGs that has come out in the current generation. So without further interruption, let's just look into what makes Nunu Kuni into the unique title that it is, shall we? Hello, I'm Peter47890 Cyrus, and welcome to my review of Nunu Kuni Wrath of the White Witch. Nunu Kuni Wrath of the White Witch is an RPG that was developed by Level 5 and published by Namco Bandai. It is only available on the PS3. Huh? Hey, wait for me! So this is... your world. That's right! A whole nother world! Beautiful, innit? Now presentation-wise, it'd be hard to talk about Nunu Kuni without discussing the collaboration that Level 5 had with Studio Ghibli in the creation of this game. Yeah, that's Studio Ghibli. The ones who made Spirit Away, Princess Mononoke, Grave of the Fireflies, Hanyo, my neighbor Totoro, and etc. And it is probably one of the most famous animation studios in Japan, with good reason, with the studio having released out remarkable movies throughout the years, such as the aforementioned Spirited Away, Grave of the Fireflies, and Princess Mononoke. It's also the animation studio that you barely see in video games, with the only other video game that come to mind that had someone from Studio Ghibli to work on it is Jay Cocoon. So suffice to say, this collaboration is pretty interesting. Now from what I've read throughout the years, there really wasn't much involvement from Studio Ghibli besides the animated cutscenes and character designs, but you can really tell that Level 5 really did want to make the game feel like a Ghibli movie. They even got Joe Hayashi to compose the music for the game, and for people who don't know, Joe Hayashi has composed a lot of the music for the various Ghibli movies that we know and love, such as Castle in the Sky, My Neighbor Totoro, Kiki's Delivery Service, Princess Mononoke, etc. So did Level 5 succeed at making the game feel like you're playing through a Ghibli movie? I would say yes. From the simple but very appealing and creative art design with the 3D character models doing the 2D artwork justice, the attention to detail you could see within the animation itself as you traverse the world, such as seeing Oliver walk cycle changing as he walk up or down a flight of stairs. Even Ghibli's unique way of animating the machinery and steampunk is in this game, to a degree. As well as Ghibli's love of nature, with how beautiful not only the overworld is, but as well as the dungeons are set in nature. From the forest areas that's lush for plant life, to desert and volcanic areas, where you can feel the heat from the scorched earth, and even plant life that is set ablaze. Unicuni really does manage to make the nature feel genuine, with the fantastical elements that are added to each area feel like a part of that fantastical nature, rather than just being added for flavor text, with it feeling familiar and fantastical, and that it is a fantastical world that you are seeing, but feels grounded enough within its own rules that you really do feel like you are in this world. 
Overall, the game does look and feel like Ghibli in the aesthetic department. But at the exact same time, Unicuni still feel like its own unique being without it just being a homage to the Ghibli movies with its world design. So all I'm saying is that the game looks beautiful, even compared to the RPGs that's coming out this generation, with the game's art style being really strong with how creative and charming it is as well as how colorful it is. And the attention to detail you can see in the game is superb and really makes it feel like you are in this game's world. Not only from the animation, but as well as seeing something simple, like your characters shivering in the cold and you having to get them for coats in order for them to travel comfortably in the environment, or them having to change into bathing suits for a town because of that town's customs, and etc. You really do feel like you're visiting this creative world, with each environment you're visiting having its own strong identity. And not to mention that the game's overworld just looks beautiful, expansive, full of color and detail, with each area still feeling unique to itself. It's one of the best overworld in an RPG that's come out in the last two generations, and I can easily understand why people were excited for that overworld when they first saw it. Overall, I can honestly say that Nino Kuni is one of the most unique looking and beautiful RPGs that I've played, and that aspect of the game is definitely one of its strong points. The sound design is pretty strong as well, the sound effects are pretty on point, and the music composed by Joe Hayashi is just a wonder to listen to. Whimsical, charming, adventurous, foreboding and sad when it needs to be, the soundtrack just has all the elements that complement a game that has a journey filled with adventure and childlike wonder, with being an absolute pleasure to listen to. Now for the voice acting. The voice acting itself is... Good. There's lots of voices I never heard here, but the voice acting is still good. The voice match well enough and the direction for the most part is pretty good. Too bad we don't really hear much of it. Yeah, the game is pretty inconsistent with what's voiced and what's not voiced. And I think the key word to use here is inconsistent. Because if they only voice the main story and the other side quests you're just reading, it'd probably be less jarring. But with what we have, their entire story segments where it's voiced one second, and then the next second, there's no voice. Especially in the end game where it felt like the sword just gave up on dubbing the game. I mean the starting parts of the game didn't really have much voice acting, but there was consistently more voice acting in the beginning rather than at the end. It's not a big issue, but it can be pretty jarring. Especially if you're coming from games that have more consistent voice acting. Now let's talk about the story and characters. Story-wise, the game takes place in a small town called Mordeville that is set in the 1950s, where we play as Oliver, our normal everyday boy, where one day, Phil, his best friend, tells him that the secret vehicle that the two has been working on is now completed, and tries to convince Oliver to come to the garage to test drive the vehicle, in the dead of night, with no adult supervision, with the road being near a riverbed. Oh boy. Anyway, Oliver reluctantly caves in to his best friend's request and sneaks out of his house at night when his mom is sleeping soundly, and then they test drive the vehicle. What a twist! Something goes wrong, with the vehicle breaking apart with both the vehicle and Oliver being in the riverbed as an aftermath, and it looks like Oliver can't swim. Neither can Phil, apparently. Luckily, Oliver's mom had a premonition of sorts and woke up and started looking for Oliver when she realized he wasn't at home and managed to find Oliver in time to rescue him in the riverbed. But just as it seems like everything is going to end well, Oliver's mother, heart condition suddenly flared up, which unfortunately resulted in her passing away. Oliver, devastated at the loss, remained in his room for three whole days afterwards, where he understandably mourns for his mom, until one moment, his tears actually brought his doll back to life. The doll is revealed to have come from another magical world, that is linked directly to this world, where the souls of both world denizens are linked with each other, and the doll, who is named Drippy, tells of Oliver's potential to be a wizard, and how he's possibly the prophesied hero that could save the other world's plight from the threat of a powerful wizard named Shadar, as well as the possibility that his mom could be saved if he's able to save the soul that is linked with Oliver's mom in the other world. Though it looks like that soul is trapped by Shadar as well. 
And so begins Oliver's magical journey into the other world, where he will experience all sorts of magical adventures, all in order to gain the means to defeat the powerful wizard Shadar, and ultimately save his mother. So what are the good parts to the story and characters of this game? Well for one, I think the overall lore of the world is probably the most interesting part of the game in terms of writing. Yeah, I'm being serious. The myths, legends, and short stories about the mythical and important figures of Nunu Kuni is where the game's writing is at its strongest. These individual short stories are imaginative, creative, and are just really fun to read through. These short stories really have the feeling that you're reading through a children's fairy tale with how they're not so much based on logical progression, but on trying to either tell a moral or trying to appeal more to your emotion to make a compelling story. With these short stories, doing it in a very imaginative and memorable way that really sticks to your mind, as well as doing tales that are very heartfelt, and these stories overall do capture that childlike imagination that we had when we were young, which I think makes them very worthwhile to go through. These short stories and legends also really make this world feel like it has a rich and old history to it. The encyclopedia part also do flesh out the world more, and make the familiar and various spells that are in this game to feel more ingrained into the game's mythology. And overall, the lore has the best writing in the game, and it's really interesting to go through. Okay, lore is fine and dandy, but what about the main story? Does it hold up as well as the lore? Well, I think the main cast of characters are likable. I wouldn't say they're the most interesting cast out there, but they're likable enough that I could play through the game as them. Oliver is your typical nice boy, but I do think his motivation on wanting to save his mom is very relatable, and his age really does make it that you want to see him succeed as well as him still being generally nice, with it being a joy to see how he grows throughout the game. Esther is probably the most energetic individual of the bunch, with her bunning heads with Swain often, but I will say that she is the weakest character too since not much is really done for her character after she joins. Still likable, but I'd be lying to if I said her role in the story isn't minimal. Swain being the only adult of the group is probably what you expect, with him being the most pessimistic, as well as being a bit grumpy. But he has some good interaction with the group, and I do think his backstory and how it ties to the story is pretty heartfelt and really does make him a bit more interesting and likable. Not the most imaginative or well-written cast out there, and overall pretty simple characters, but it's a decent enough cast with there being some pretty effective dramatic scenes done with the characters that are pretty heartfelt. And the last appeal to the main story for me is probably the sense of adventure I got from the story. This has partly got to do with the lore as well as the visual design of the world, but I do think what plays a good part of that sense of adventure is the very relaxed atmosphere the game has as well as the pacing. Yeah, Oliver and company still got an overarching defined goal, which is ultimately defeating Shadar, but the game pacing give time for the group to react to their environments naturally, rather than just be a place they have to go for a plot device to defeat Shadar. The atmosphere isn't too lax that it looks like we're just visiting these places willy-nilly, with there still being a reason why we're in these places, but still relaxed enough that we're still able to breathe and take in the environment, which in turn let these fun environments to leave an impact on us with it really feeling like we're exploring these creative places under the lens of a child, which really does give the story that likeable and charming sense of adventure that's filled with childlike wonder. But yeah, those are the story's strongest points. The plot itself is pretty standard, which can be surprising with how imaginative the world is, but the likeable characters, the game's atmosphere and pacing, as well as the interesting world, really does suck you in and get you invested. I wouldn't really say that the main story is as well written as the various short stories you find within the lore of Nunu Kune, but there's still enough likability in the main story that I still enjoy the game. Into the White Witch part of the game rear its head. Yeah, if there was one part of the story that I disliked, it'd be the White Witch part, which is surprising since you think that would be the best part of the game since the game is subtitled after her, but her parts are just so rushed and really adds nothing to the story to the point that it feels like filler. At its worst, it needlessly continues a story that really didn't need to be continued, with feeling like padding that was added to the story at the last second. I say this because when the Shadar storyline does conclude, it really does feel like a conclusive ending. But then the, the game is like, oh yeah, here's the White Witch. Enjoy. 
Albert the game does sprinkle in scenes with the White Witch throughout the game, but she doesn't really do anything substantial in the story, and those scenes are just there to remind us that she's in the story. And when the White Witch does appear, it clashes with the conclusive ending that we had with the Shadar arc so abruptly, that I felt like she was a last minute addition to the story that the writers had to write in. But what I think the crux of the problem is, is that the White Witch storyline just feels like filler. Nothing is really expanded that really warrants the White Witch arc. The characters for one don't really develop in interesting new ways and just remain the same as they did in the Shadar arc since all their development already happened. The new party members that the expanded storyline added is wasted potential since the new storyline doesn't really do anything with the new party member, which is especially disappointing since the new party member was a character that we already knew from the Shadar storyline and it would have been cool to learn more about them and see them develop in new interesting ways, but nope! Nothing of value is done to the new party member. The lands we get to explore is also whizzed by very quickly, so we don't really get the opportunity to get impacted by their environment, with it really feeling like we're here to activate a plot point. Which is the opposite of what I felt when I was going through the main story and visiting all these interesting locations, which is a real letdown. The only neat addition that was warranted was probably how it go more in depth with the councilman who helped Oliver to get Mornstar, and why he helped Oliver. The White Witch backstory is also okay but kind of lazily put together. But I don't think those additions really warrant continuing a storyline where it had no business of continuing, if I had to be honest. Especially when it's being replaced by an ending that is exceedingly weaker than the original ending. But still, the White Witch part doesn't destroy the story. The worst thing it probably does is, again, somewhat artificially extending the game beyond what it needed to be, as well as replacing the better Shadar ending with the not as good White Witch ending. But the story is still enjoyable. I just thought they could have just wrote out the White Witch part and just do some minor changes in the story to make it flow better. Now we get to the gameplay of Nui Kuni. Now the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the structure of the game. Structurally, the game plays out like most JRPGs, with you progressing through the game pretty linearly, with you going from point A to point B to progress the game, which usually get you to go through various towns, fight through dungeons with you solving simple puzzles along the way, with there being a boss at the end. There's also an overworld map that tie all these areas together, with the overworld being expansive especially once you get the boat and other means of transportation. For side content, there's also all type of side quests you can do in this game, with the rewards being gold and more importantly, damps you can get from the Adventurers Guild, which can lead you some pretty neat rewards if you get enough, with the rewards ranging from the pretty funny but useless jump to getting various boons in battle, such as reducing how much MP your abilities cost. There's also a bunch of mini games you can do in this game, well, mostly from the casino, but the mini games being typical of what you expect, from slot machines to various card games such as blackjack. Though there is an interesting mini game where you have to control both Oliver and Esther and guide them through various platforms, which can be tricky. Overall, the structure of the game works well. The dungeons are at a good enough length where they feel long enough they feel substantial, but short enough that it doesn't feel like it overstays welcome. With the small puzzles that is introduced along the way, doing a good job of changing up how each dungeon play and feels. The puzzles aren't game changing, but they do enough that it makes each dungeon feel different from each other. I also like how the puzzles give that golden sun feel to them, in terms of you having to use the spells you learn throughout your journey to solve them, which makes your spell feel more integrated into the game's world building, even though the puzzles themselves are pretty simple. The overworld itself is also done well, with it being expansive enough that feels like a good representation of how big the world of Nunikuni is, but also not too big that feels like it's a hassle to go from location to location, especially once you get a means of transportation besides walking. The enemy placement design in both the overworld and dungeons are also adequate, 
with there being enough enemy fights that you can possibly have fun with the combat system, but not too much that it feels overkill. As for the side quests themselves, I think the rewards are good, especially with the eventual guild boons you can get, but the actual side quests themselves are kind of lacking. Now hunt quests are okay, and I would say the hard side missions were a pretty novel idea, but the hard side quests themselves really does get reduced to just fetch quests, but instead of items, you're just getting the required emotions from a person who got too much of said emotion and then transferring to our heartbroken person. And the stories within these side quests are pretty simple, and don't get more elaborate beyond that person's situation getting better. As it is, the hard side quests can feel like filler, with how they all plays out the same way from the start of the game to the end. And a lot of the side quests are like that, in terms of feeling fetch questy, with there being no major story payoff, and the task that these side quests have you do not changing much and thus feeling a bit samey. But still, at least they're not a hassle to do. With that said, I do think there are a bunch of side quests that are pretty good, and that's mostly got to do with the side quests involving Horus. These side quests usually get you to read through the wizard's compendium and figure out what the answers to his riddle in question is, with it being pretty fun to figure out since uh, the answer is not really spelled out for you. The mini games themselves are also pretty typical, and there's really nothing inherently wrong with them unless you don't like playing slots or blackjack or any other similar card games. There is one thing that might make people groan about the structure though, and that is the amount of hand holding that is in this game. There is a lot of hand holding with the game beating you over the head with information about game mechanics that you should already know, which is pretty annoying. It doesn't destroy the game, but it is very noticeable. Overall, the structure works well enough for the game. The structure is pretty much what you expect from a game like this, with the exception of possibly seeing an actual overworld, rather than a few to few transition in this day and age, but it's all handled pretty well, with there only being a few missteps, with those missteps not really bringing down the experience much. Now we get to the combat of the game. Oh boy, the combat. The combat system is a mix of turn-based and real-time action, as well as elements of Pokemon being added in, in terms of having controllable creatures that you can use in battle. But let's go more in depth with how combat works. Anyway, in battle, you're initially only able to use Oliver, but eventually you will have the option to control one of the three human characters that's available, with each of them having their own skill sets and abilities that they can use, with Oliver being your general magic user, Esther being your healer and buffer, and Swain being your typical thief, with abilities that allows him to steal and deal status effects to enemies. But along with the normal spells and abilities that they can use, they are also able to summon familiars to do battle in their stead, with each human character being able to summon one familiar in the field along with having a reserve of two additional familiars that they can swap between their current familiar on the field. So essentially, your party can have up to three familiars out on the given field at one time, assuming that nobody is knocked out, but also have the capacity of nine different type of familiars to use and swap between throughout the battle. Each familiar you can use have their own strengths and weaknesses, as well as a move set that you can take advantage of, with you having to take note that a human character and their familiar share an HP pool. There's also a timer that indicates how long you can keep a particular familiar out, with you needing to switch between familiars, or you run the risk of your familiar being in a cooldown state where they can't really do anything for a period of time. And speaking of cooldown, let's talk about how the game mixes turn-based and real-time combat mechanics. Like in a real-time combat system, you'll be able to move your characters around and do actions in real time. But the turn-based combat aspect of the game manifests itself through how you execute your moves, with you having to select what action you want to do through a menu, with each action you're doing having a set period of cooldown after you do it, as well as a period of time where you see the action unfold before your eyes, with the AI taking control of your character and doing the actions for you, rather like in a turn-based combat system. Though that's not to say that everything about the combat system is in real time. You're able to pause the combat whenever you're choosing a spell or an ability when you're using a human character, or as well as when you're choosing tactics, as well as when you're switching characters. There's also an orb mechanic in the game where, throughout the battle, 
Different type of orbs called gleams will appear out of enemy as you fight them, and if you get them, you will get a variety of effects from them. These can range from recovering HP and MP, to what is probably the most powerful orb effect, which are the golden glims, which allow your familiar or your character to do their special attack, as well as recovering their health. Oh man, the combat to this game. I'm just going to give it to you guys straight, it's incredibly flawed. Now there are some things I like, mostly with how it encourages you to use multiple familiars due to how each familiar have their own strikes and weaknesses, as well as the timer system encouraging you into that mindset because of the cooldown penalty that happens if you don't take account of the timer system, which does make you think on how you should set up your team composition. In fact, I say that the familiar aspect of the combat system is done well enough. I also do like the orb mechanic to a degree, with it rewarding you for playing well in terms of how the golden gleams appear more frequently for skillful play, such as if you do elemental attacks that the enemy are weak against, defending at the right time, and etc. It's just satisfying to see your good play being rewarded with that reward being gratifying, which is namely recovering your HP as well as being able to see your character's special attacks being unleashed, which are usually both powerful as well as flashy. Even though the golden orb mechanic itself isn't an integral part of the combat, with how most of the battles don't really have the golden gleam mechanic appear, it's still pretty satisfying to utilize when you do have the chance. But besides that, there's really nothing good to the combat. Now I can highlight a bunch of flaws that really should damage a combat system, such as the AI settings. It's really limited, especially with how you can't even set the AI to conserve their MP when it's at a certain percentage threshold, with the setting only really allowing it where the AI either use their abilities or not, which is really baffling. It gets you to babysit your party member even more than you should in a real-time combat system. This is especially prevalent when you find out that you can't even disable certain abilities that the AI can do, which gets you to see them doing really useless abilities that waste precious MP and get you to babysit them even more. And let's not forget how an important feature of the game, i.e. commanding all your playable characters to attack or defend, comes in way too late. How about the fact that character switching is annoying in this game, since you can never choose the familiar a different human character have from the get-go? Yeah, whenever you're switching characters, for some reason, you go to the human character by default and then have to choose which familiar that human character have. For example, if I'm switching from Oliver to Swain, I can't just pick one of Swain's familiars from the get-go. I have to go to the switch menu, choose Swain, and then go to the switch menu again to choose which familiar I want that Swain has. And you can't even go with the familiar they had out at the time, since switching to a different human character makes that human character withdraw their familiar for some reason. And really, I can probably list a lot more flaws with this game's combat system, but I want to now focus on what is the main problem with Nunukuni's combat system. Because believe it or not, those flaws I listed doesn't destroy the combat system. Yeah, they severely limit the enjoyment of the combat system, but it doesn't cripple it. What does cripple it though, is what is essentially the main problem to Nunukuni's combat system, which is to say its lack of identity. Unicuni's combat system is probably one of the more flawed mix of real-time and turn-based combat mechanics just because the elements that the game adds from both styles contradict each other rather than complementing each other, which overall makes the combat system feel like it doesn't have a focus on what it wants to be. Does it want to be more action-based? It might seem that way with how you can do actions in real-time as well as having options to cancel your current action to do another action that will fit the current situation. Elbit, the way how you choose to do your action is unorthodox in a real-time combat system, but it is still all in real-time, for the most part. So yeah, you might think that the combat system is trying to focus on the strength of a real-time combat system. But the turn-based part of the game gets in the way of that, with how you can't do on-the-fly actions because of how the turn-based user interface is designed namely with how you have to scroll through your selections in order to do your desired actions, rather than being able to do your desired actions in an instance through a button prompt or a button combination, like in a normal real-time combat system. 
Having the control of being able to do your character's actions the moment you need it is one of the important factors of a real-time combat system. And Nino Kuni ultimately doesn't have that, with the control scheme being more akin to a turn-based game. Which is great in a turn-based game, where the game pauses every turn, but not so much in a real-time combat system, where every second is ticking down. You need to be able to do on-the-spot actions in order to, for you to feel fully in control. You need that precision in a real-time combat system to make it feel like you are that character and actually fighting an enemy. But that precision isn't found in the game's combat system, with the turn-based user interface ultimately being the main problem. The other factor that contributes how the turn-based elements go against the real-time mechanics is also how whenever you do an action, control is taken from you and the AI takes over with you simply seeing the action happens rather than doing it yourself. Suffice to say, having the control of a real-time combat system outright being taken from you kind of negates the major strengths of a real-time combat system, with it feeling like you're just watching a battle unfold rather than actually controlling your characters and utilizing their moves in a real-time setting, which really does result in all the intricacies of a real-time combat system to be stripped. Okay, then is the combat system trying to play to the strengths of a turn-based combat system instead then? I would say it doesn't really do a good job of that as well. Now this might sound contradictory, but ultimately, the problem to the combat boils down to how it lacks the control of a turn-based combat system to make the turn-based part of the game to be satisfying, even though it has the control scheme of one. Yeah, this sounds confusing, so let me explain. The decisive problem to the combat system, from a turn-based point of view, again comes to the problem I mentioned before, with how you can't do the actions you want your party to do at the time you want it, due to how this game's user interface is designed within the real-time combat system. With that said, it being set in real-time isn't what kills it. There are turn-based games that is set in real-time. Kind of. That still works like the countless variation of the ATB system that the Final Fantasy series uses. But there are two important factors that make these systems work, and are the key factors of why turn-based combat systems are enjoyable in general. Party control, and ways to pre-plan your moves in advance. Party control for one is a pretty important feature in a turn-based combat system, since one of the joys in such a system is finding out the strengths and weaknesses of each party member and using them in a way that they synergize well with each other to the point that you can defeat any enemy that the game presents. Party control is essentially the main way of utilizing all the abilities you have under your disposal within this type of combat system, with the satisfaction ultimately coming from being able to figure out which combination of abilities will work against an enemy, provided if that enemy is tough enough and if there's enough meat to the combat system that makes learning and executing the combat to be satisfying. Suffice to say, not being able to reliably have access to all those abilities in a turn-based combat system kind of gets in the way of that satisfaction. Being able to pre-plan your moves is also important, since one of the elements that differentiate turn-based combat systems is being able to plan out your moves in a methodical manner, whether that be selecting your options for a menu with time freezing in each turn, or having enough time to weigh your options and then select what move you want to do with you still being able to discern who's going next and to be able to plan out how to counter the enemy's moves preemptively. Essentially, party control and the ability to pre-plan are the foundations of what make turn-based combat systems as fun as they are, and sadly, Nunukuni is pretty lacking in these factors. With Nunukuni lacking the latter, with how both the pacing of the game and the user interface make it that you can't pre-plan your moves effectively with the user interface being too cumbersome to navigate and plan out your moves methodically, given the pace of the real-time combat system, which is admittedly quick. By far not the fastest paced combat system when compared to other games with a real-time combat system, but when you're taking account the turn-based user interface, along with how there's not really an option to freeze time for every action like you could in Final Fantasy XII, as well as how quick paced the combat is, the quick pace does hurt the game in the long run with how the user interface is designed within its framework. Nunukuni also lacks the former factor, namely party control, with how the party control is really limited in the game due to how limited the AI settings are in the game. So ultimately, the factors that make turn-based combat systems fun at its core is missing Nunukuni. And really, oh, this combat system is just a mess. 
It's not like combat systems that has turn-based and real-time mechanics mixed in can't work, because I have seen games that actually mix the two styles pretty well, with the examples I'm going to give out being Final Fantasy XII and Valkyria Chronicles. But a hybrid system that mixes turn-based and real-time elements together needs to have a clear idea on what its combat system is trying to achieve by combining these two elements together, just because the two styles are usually antithesis of each other. Final Fantasy XII and Valkyria Chronicles are two games where the hybrid system works, because they do have a clear idea on what they want their combat system to emphasize, and knew what aspect of the two styles to add in and take out. Just so that the combat system can feel cohesive, and not feel like it's fighting against each other. This is not the case for Nino Kuni, with how parts of its combat mechanics clashes against each other. Which is a great shame, because I do think the combat system does have potential with how it handles familiars. Everything revolving around the familiar system is a good concept for a Pokemon-esque game set in a combat system that is in real time. I just think that the foundation of where that concept is built upon is incredibly flawed with how it executes its fusion of turn-based and real-time combat mechanics, with it feeling like you're fighting against the system itself at times, with it also not having the satisfaction of either a turn-based or real-time combat system, namely with how you don't have the party control and ability to pre-plan to make the turn-based part fun, with it also not satisfying the real-time combat system part with how the turn-based part strips the control and precision you have from a real-time combat system. Which overall results in the combat system not really being all that fun to play mechanically. It can still be satisfying, just to see the familiar you raise up totally decimate your enemies, but that's more on the familiar building rather than the combat itself. In terms of the combat itself, I just wanted to go through with it as fast as possible by the end of it. Which I did when I grinded to get dinosaurs, who, by the way, is really broken. Yeah, that familiar alone trivializes the entire game. Now that we're done with the combat system, let's go briefly into the alchemy system. And I mean brief, since A, I think it's pretty simple, and B, I didn't really dig into the alchemy system much. Now the alchemy system works as much as what you expect an item creation system to work in RPG. You simply combine two items together to make another. And yeah. Like I said, I can't really comment much on it since I barely used it, but from what I have used, it works well. I do think other level 5 games have more involving item creation systems like in the Dark Cloud games, but it's still rather done well in this game. Now let's get to the progression system. Leveling system wise, the game uses a typical leveling system found in most RPGs, with you earning experience for battle, and when you get enough, you level up, with you learning abilities once you reach a certain level. Do note that your familiars will have a level cap, which will play into the evolution or metamorphosize mechanic, as well as a set number of moves that they can learn. Equipment system wise, it also follows the standard RPG formula, with it following a linear progression curve, with the weapon and armor you find down the road just having better stats over your old equipment. The other progression system I probably should talk about is the familiar building now. Well before that, I should discuss how you capture familiars to begin with. Once you get far enough in the game to have Esther, you will have the ability to capture familiars with her serenade technique, though the factor that determines if you're able to capture one is total RNG. Yeah, no skill based mechanic or a mechanic to manipulate RNG in your favor, just unbiased, cruel RNG. Oh, now let's get to the familiar building itself. Like I said before, familiars will be able to get stronger the more experience they earn in battle, which will get them to level up, and they'll level up eventually to a point where they'll be able to metamorphosize into their next form if you have the right type of item as well. Once they do, their level will reset and their stats will also be around what you expect at level 1 will be, though they will have boosted stats, especially if you wait until a familiar reaches the level cap before metamorphosizing them. Along with them getting better stats in their evolved forms, They'll be able to learn new abilities that they couldn't before in their previous forms, with them also retaining the abilities they learned in their previous forms. And lastly, I'll talk about the creature cage mechanic in regards to the familiar building. The creature cage mechanic is basically a way to give extra stats to your familiars, with you being able to raise a specific stat by feeding them a specific food. But do note that you can't just feed them a bunch of food in one go, 
You have to wait a bit after to get full, and there is a limit to how many stats you can boost. Overall, the progression system that is found in Unicuni is simple but works well enough. The leveling system for one does a good job of giving you a feeling of progression with both the improved stats you get as well as the new abilities you can use with you do feeling stronger as you progress the game. The equipment system also accomplishes that same feeling, though only for stats. The metamorphosis system does a pretty good job of making your familiar feel stronger as well through the boosted stats and the additional new moves the familiar can learn, with the updated looks being a nice bonus. It's still sort of annoying how you still have to babysit the evolved familiar during the initial levels, but this problem isn't too bad since it doesn't take too long to level them up to a point where they feel comparable and eventually stronger than their previous form. And lastly, the monster building is also pretty well done, with you do feeling like your familiar is getting exponentially stronger by utilizing the monster building mechanic, with it also offering a bunch of customization options to build up how your party plays like. Whether that be through deciding what type of move you want your familiar to learn and keep, deciding what type of evolution you want your familiar to undergo when they reach their third stage of evolution, with each different evolution having their own strengths and weaknesses, to even deciding what stat you want increased for familiar from using the creature cage mechanic. Add in how there's a good variety of familiars that each have their own strengths and weaknesses, and you overall have a lot of options to build up and customize how your party plays like. Albeit the familiar building isn't as in-depth as something like Pokemon or even the Shin Megumi Tensei games, but there's still enough in there to make the familiar building satisfying. If there is one fault within the familiar system though, it's probably be how you capture familiars. Part of the reason is probably the fact that capturing familiars is total RNG. Which can make that part of the game a bit boring since there's really no strategy and skill to it, besides doing it over and over again. And that boredom can sometimes turn into frustration if you're trying to catch that one specific familiar. I'm looking at you, Dinosaurus. So yeah, familiar capturing is a bit annoying, but not too bad overall. Overall, Ninukuni is a game that I'm pretty mixed with. I really want to like the game because it does have its strong points, such as the charming ghibli -esque aesthetic, the beautiful music, the imaginative and creative lore within the world of Ninukuni, the world itself being one of the better overworlds found in recent gaming, the story and characters being likable enough that it's still an enjoyable journey to experience, and then there's the familiar building which is overall pretty satisfying to sink your teeth in. But I do think it's unfortunately held back by various design choices, as well as the execution not being stellar in some areas of the game, such as the ending parts of the game feeling pretty filler, the side quest why novel first does feel fetch questy at the end of the day, and then there's the combat, which is pretty flawed to say the least, in its fusion of turn-based and real-time combat mechanics. Now that said, I can understand why people like this game as much as they do, it just has this unique charm to it that no other game has really replicated, with it still feeling unique even 5 years after its release. It's just a shame that I couldn't personally like it as much as other people. 